Mr. Kastner is recognized for 30 minutes. Good morning, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, members of the committee, and members of the staff. My name is Steve Castor. I'm a congressional staff member. Uh, I serve with the Oversight Committee on the Republican staff with uh, Mr. Jordan. I'm also, for purposes of this investigation, a shared staffer with the Judiciary Select Committee on Intelligence and Mr. Nunes. Um, it sure is atypical for a staffer to be presenting, but again, thanks for, for having me. Uh, the purpose of this hearing, as we understand it, is to discuss whether President Donald J. Trump's conduct fits the definition of a high crime and misdemeanor. It does not. Such that the committee should consider articles of impeachment to remove the president from office, and it should not. This case, in many respects, comes down to eight lines in a call transcript. Let me say clearly and unequivocally that the answer to that question is no. The record in the Democrats' impeachment inquiry does not show that President Trump abused the power of his office or obstructed Congress. To impeach a president who 63 million people voted for over eight lines script is baloney. Democrats seek to impeach President Trump not because they have evidence of high crimes or misdemeanors, but because they disagree with his policies. This impeachment inquiry is not the organic outgrowth of serious misconduct. Democrats have been searching for a set of facts on which to impeach President Trump since his inauguration on January 20th, 2017. Just 27 minutes after the president's inauguration that day, the Washington Post ran a story that the campaign to impeach the president has already begun. The article reported Democrats and liberal activists are mounting broad opposition to stymieing Trump's agenda and noted that impeachment strategists believe the Constitution's emoluments clause would be the vehicle. In the first two years of the administration, Democrats in the House introduced articles of impeachment to remove President Trump from office on several very different factual bases. On January 3rd, the very first day of the new Congress, Congressman Sherman introduced articles of impeachment against the president. The same day, Representative Tlaib said, we're gonna go in there, we're gonna impeach the president. In May 2019, Representative Green said on MSNBC, if we don't impeach this president, he will be reelected. Even Speaker Pelosi, who has said that impeachment is a somber and prayerful exercise, has called President Trump an imposter and said it is dangerous to allow voters to judge his performance in 2020. The obsession with impeaching the president is reflected in how Democrats have used the power of their majority in the past 11 months. In the Oversight Committee, the Democrats' first announced witness was Michael Cohen, a disgraced felon who, was, who pleaded guilty to lying to Congress. When he came before us at the Oversight Committee, he then lied again as many as eight times. Oversight Committee Democrats demanded information about the president's personal finances and even subpoenaed the president's accounting firm, Mazars, for large swaths of sensitive and personal financial information about the entire Trump family. The subpoena was issued over the objection of committee Republicans and without a vote. In the Ways and Means Committee, Democrats demanded the president's personal tax return information. The reason they cited for wanting the president's tax returns, they said, was to oversee the IRS's audit process for presidential tax returns. You can judge that for yourself. In the Financial Services Committee, Democrats demanded and subpoenaed the president's bank records going back 10 years. The Financial Services Committee staff, the Republicans tell me, the information demanded would cover every withdrawal, credit card swipe, or debit card purchase of every member of the Trump family, including his minor child. The reason that the Democrats gave for why they needed such voluminous and intrusive personal information about the Trump family was, get this, financial industry compliance with banking statutes and regulations. Here in the Judiciary Committee, Democrats sent out letters demanding information from over 80 recipients, including the president's children, business partners, employees, his campaign, businesses, and foundation. 
Of course, the main event for the Judiciary Committee was the report of Special Counsel Mueller, which Democrats would believe would serve as the evidentiary basis for impeaching the president. Despite interviewing 500 witnesses, issuing 2,800 subpoenas, executing almost 500 search warrants, and spending $25 million, the special counsel's 19 attorneys and 40 FBI agents, analysts, and staff found no conspiracy or coordination between the Trump campaign and the Russian government. After the Trump-Russia collusion allegations did not pan out, Democrats focused their efforts on obstruction of justice. They criticized Attorney General Barr for concluding that no crime of obstruction had occurred in the special counsel investigation. But in fact, it was entirely appropriate for the Attorney General to make that call because the special counsel declined to do so. Not surprisingly, the Democrats' Mueller hearing was underwhelming, to say the least. And the sequel with Corey Lewandowski definitely did not move the impeachment needle either. The Intelligence Committee, too, was heavily invested in the Russia collusion investigation. Committee Democrats hired former federal prosecutors to prepare for their anticipated efforts to impeach the president. Now that the Russian collusion allegations did not work out, Democrats have settled on the Ukraine phone call, eight lines the president uttered on July 25th with Ukrainian President Zelensky. But the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Committee of Jurisdiction, wasn't the committee leaving the impeachment inquiry or holding the hearings. Neither was the Oversight Committee, the House's chief investigative entity. The Judiciary Committee was only recently brought back into the mix after fact-finding concluded. Instead, the impeachment inquiry was run by the House Intelligence Committee and these former federal prosecutors. Democrats on the Intelligence Committee ran the impeachment inquiry in a manifestly unfair way. All the fact-finding was unclassified, and that was made clear at the top of every single deposition, but the Democrats took advantage of the closed-door process in the Capitol basement bunker, the SCIF, to control access to information. The secrecy effectively weaponized the investigation, allowing misleading public narratives to form and catch hold with careful leaks of witness testimony. Democrats refused to invite Republican witnesses and directed witnesses called by the Democrats not to answer our questions. In the public hearings, many of these unfair processes continued. Democrats refused to invite numerous witnesses requested by Republicans, interrupted Republican questioning, and prevented witnesses from answering Republican questions. Democrats voted down by virtue of a motion to table, with no notice, subpoenas for documents and testimony requested by Republicans. I'll note that Democrats never once brought any of their subpoenas to a vote before the Intelligence Committee. This unfair process reflects the degree to which Democrats are obsessed with impeaching the president. The Democrats went searching for a set of facts on which to impeach the president the Emoluments Clause, the, pe the President's business and financial records, the Mueller report, allegations of obstruction before landing on the Ukraine phone call. The impeachment inquiry is clearly an orchestrated effort to upend our political system. According to Politico, the Speaker has tightly scripted every step of the impeachment inquiry. Democrats have reportedly convened focus groups to test which allegations whether it be quid pro quo or bribery or extortion, uh, were most compelling to the American public. Speaker Pelosi said Democrats must strike while the iron is hot on impeaching the president. The entire duration of the impeachment inquiry from the time Speaker Pelosi announced it on September 24th until today has been 76 days. As Professor Turley testified last Wednesday, this impeachment would stand out among modern impeachments as the shortest proceeding with the thinnest evidentiary record and the narrowest grounds ever used to impeach a president. The artificial and arbitrary political deadline by which Democrats are determined to finish impeachment by Christmas leads to a rushed process and missed opportunities to obtain relevant information. 
Democrats avoided the accommodations process required by federal courts in disputes between Congress and the executive. Democrats declined to attempt to negotiate with the administration for the production of documents and witnesses. Democrats did not exhaust all their options to entice witnesses or agencies to cooperate, such as allowing witnesses to appear with agency lawyers or initiating contempt proceedings. Sometimes the threat of a contempt proceeding gets you a different result. Sometimes the witnesses choose to appear when contempt is on the table. Democrats even withdrew a subpoena to one witness who asked a federal court to resolve conflicting orders from Congress and the executive, either because the Democrats did not want to wait for the court to rule or they didn't like the presiding judge, Judge Leon. Instead, Democrats made their demands and refused to budge. Democrats told witnesses at the outset that their refusal to cooperate in full would be used against them and the president. Democrats threatened federal employees that their salaries could be withheld for not meeting committee demands. These tactics are fundamentally unfair and counterproductive for gathering information in any serious inquiry. This rushed and take it or leave it approach to investigating is contrary to how successful congressional investigations typically work. Congressional investigations take time. There is no easy button. In this job, you must take the information that's offered even if you don't like the terms. You should not say no to taking a witness's testimony because you would prefer the agency counsel's not present. If that's the only means of obtaining the testimony, you should take it. Your priority must not be on blocking information out, it must be on seeking information. In all recent major congressional investigations, uh, for example, Chairman Goodlatte and Gowdy's investigation into the Justice Department's decision during 2016, the IRS targeting investigation, the Benghazi investigation, and Fast and Furious, there have been give and take between Congress and the executive. In the Goodlatte Gowdy investigation, for example, it took two months, two months of negotiations before the committees conducted the first witness interview with Deputy Director McCabe. The Justice Department only began producing documents to the committee after many more months of discussions. In none of these investigations did Congress get everything it wanted right at the beginning, certainly not within 60 or 76 days, but with persistence and patience, we eventually did receive enough information to do our work. And contrary to talking points, the Trump administration has in fact cooperated with and facilitated congressional oversight and investigations. For example, earlier this year, the Oversight Committee conducted an investigation into security clearances at the White House. The central allegation put forward was that the White House deviated from established procedures to grant clearances to certain White House staff. The Democrats sought to interview career staff who performed these uh, security clearance reviews but declined the witness initially to appear with agency counsel. The House and the White House were at an impasse. However, after a little bit of time, we, the Republican staff, with the help of Mr. Jordan, convinced the witness to appear with agency counsel for our own transcribed interview. And the Democrats came along. The subsequent interviews in the security clearance investigation were conducted with agency counsel. The testimony allowed the committee to obtain the evidence, to get to the bottom of what was going on, and it wasn't what was alleged. Nobody outside the security clearance office was handing out clearances, certainly not to senior White House staffers. In this impeachment inquiry, however, Democrats have turned away information that could be valuable to the inquiry by disallowing agency counsel to accompany witnesses. Democrats have turned away information by declining to negotiate in good faith with the administration about the scope of document requests. As a result of these failures, the evidentiary record in the impeachment inquiry is incomplete and in many places incoherent. The failure to exhaust all avenues to obtain information severely risks undermining the legitimacy of any articles of impeachment. As Professor Turley said to the committee last week, 
I'm concerned about lowering impeachment standards to fit a paucity of evidence and an abundance of anger. I believe this impeachment not only fails the standard of past impeachments, but would create a dangerous precedent for future impeachments. Professor Turley elaborated that the current lack of proof is another reason why the abbreviated investigation into this matter is so damaging for the case of impeachment. The substantive case for impeaching President Trump as a result of an artificial, arbitrary, and political schedule relies heavily on ambiguous facts, presumptions, and speculation. President Turley warned here too that impeachments have been based on proof, not presumptions. The Democrats do not have the proof. Now my Democrat counterparts on the Intelligence Committee are talented attorneys. I'm sure they will tell you a riveting story about a shadow or irregular foreign policy apparatus and a smear campaign designed to extort Ukraine for the president's political benefit. They'll tell you about President Trump and how he put his own political interests ahead of national security by mentioning former, president, former Vice President Joe Biden by name and raising the allegations of Ukrainian influence in the 2016 election on the July 25th call. They'll try to convince you that the Trump administration, the same administration Democrats regularly accuse of being incompetent, orchestrated an international conspiracy at the highest levels. None of this adds up. It may be a great screenplay, but it's not what the evidence shows. The Democrats' impeachment inquiry ignores all of the evidence that does not advance their story. The Democrats' impeachment narrative resolves all ambiguous facts and conflicting evidence in a way that is most unflattering to the president. The Democrats' impeachment narrative ignores public statements from senior Ukrainian officials that contradict the narrative. As you listen to the Democrat presentation later today, I urge you to keep these points in mind. What evidence that has been gathered in the impeachment inquiry paints a different picture? I won't provide a detailed presentation now, but allow me to highlight a few points. First, the summary of the July 25th phone call reflects no conditionality or pressure. President Zelensky never vocalized any discomfort or pressure on the call. Contrary to Democrat allegations, President Trump was not asking for a favor that would help his reelection. He was asking for assistance in helping our country move forward from the divisiveness of the Russia collusion investigation. Second, since President Trump has declassified and publicly released the call summary 75 days ago, President Zelensky has said publicly and repeatedly that he felt no pressure. He said it on September 25th at the United Nations General Assembly. He said it in an interview published on October 6th. He said it again on October 10th. And most recently, he said it just last week in Time Magazine. Other senior Ukrainian officials have also said there was no linkage between a meeting, security assistance, and an investigation. If President Trump was truly orchestrating a pressure campaign to force Ukraine to investigate former Vice President Biden, one would think that Ukraine would have felt some pressure. Third, at the time of the July 25th call, senior officials in Kyiv did not know that the security assistance was paused. They did not learn it was paused until the pause was reported publicly in the US media on August 28th. As Ambassador Volker testified, because the highest levels of the Ukrainian government did not know about the pause, there was no leverage implied. Finally, President Zelensky met with President Trump in New York on September 25th at the United Nations. Shortly thereafter, or shortly uh, before that, the, the, the security assistance flowed to Ukraine. Both happened without Ukraine ever taking actions or investigations. The impeachment record also has substantial evidence going to the president's state of mind undercutting the Democrats' assertion of some malicious intent. Witnesses testified that President Trump has a deeply rooted, genuine, and reasonable skepticism of Ukraine stemming from its history of corruption. 
President Trump is skeptical of U.S. taxpayer-funded foreign assistance and believes that our allies should share more of the burden of Ukraine's defense. Ukrainian politicians openly spoke out against President Trump during the 2016 election. These events bear directly on the president's state of mind. President Zelensky had run on an anti-corruption platform, but he was an untried politician with a relationship to a controversial Ukrainian oligarch. When, Vice, when former Vice President Pence met with President Zelensky in Warsaw, I'm sorry, when Vice President Pence met with President Zelensky in Warsaw on September 1, he stressed to him the need for reform and reiterated the President's concern about burden sharing, especially among European allies. In late August and early September, after his party took control of the Ukrainian parliament, Ukraine passed historic reforms to fight corruption. These reforms including removing parliamentary immunity, which witnesses said had been a historic source of corruption. Imagine if members of our Congress had immunity. President Trump later lifted the pause on security assistance and met with President Zelensky two weeks later. The aid was paused for 55 days. Very simply, the evidence in the Democrats' impeachment inquiry does not support the conclusion that President Trump abused his power for his own personal political benefit. There is simply no clear evidence that President Trump acted with malicious intent in withholding a meeting or security assistance. Indeed, there are, and the Republican report articulates them, legitimate explanations for these actions that are not nefarious, as the Democrats allege. The evidence shows that President Trump faithfully executed the duties of his office by delivering on what he promised the American voters he would do. Democrats may disagree with the president's policy decisions or their manner in which he governs, but those disagreements are not enough to justify the irrevocable action of removing him from office. The Democrats' hyperbole and histrionics are no good reason, 11 months out from an election, to prevent the American people from deciding on their own who is going to be their next president. This record also does not support a conclusion that President Trump obstructed Congress during the impeachment inquiry for many of the procedural defects I touched on earlier. Additionally, as a factual matter, the only direct testimony the investigation has obtained about the president's reaction to the inquiry is from Ambassador Sondland, who testified President Trump told him to cooperate and tell the truth. President Trump has also declassified and released the summaries of his two phone calls with the president, President Zelensky. President Trump has said that he would like witnesses to testify, but he's been forced to resist the unfair and abusive process. I believe strongly in the prerogatives of the Congress. It's awful to hear President Turley's testimony from last week when he critiqued the House for proceeding on impeachment so rapidly and on such a thin record. Professor Turley said to set this abbreviated schedule, demand documents, and then impeach because they haven't been turned over when they go to court, I think is an abuse of power. The impeachment of a duly elected president, as Chairman Nadler said in 1998, is the undoing of a national election. Now, I understand Democrats issued a report over the weekend arguing that contrary to the chairman's statement in 1998, impeachment is not undoing it, uh, an election. I would just respond by saying that I don't think many of the 63 million Americans from all around the country who voted for President Trump in 2016 would agree. By impeaching President Trump, the House would essentially be nullifying the decision of those Americans. And the House would be doing it Less than, le less than 11 months before the next election. There still is no compelling argument for why Democrats in the House must take this decision out of the hands of the voters and do it before Christmas. During the Clinton impeachment in 1998, the chairman said that at a bare minimum, the president's accusers must go beyond hearsay and innuendo and beyond the demands that the president prove, prove his innocence of vague and changing charges. I would submit that those words ring as true today as the chairman believed them to be in 1998. The impeachment record is heavily reliant on hearsay, innuendo, and presumptions. 
Democrats have lobbed vague and ever-changing charges for impeachment going as far back as the president's inauguration. For all these reasons, the extraordinary exercise of the House's impeachment authority is not warranted on the evidentiary record presented. Uh, thank you for allowing me uh, to present this information this morning, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Thank you both for your presentations. Mr. Burke, you are now excused, and we will invite Mr. Goldman to take his place at the witness table. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Chairman.